Hi, this is Awani Review and with me, Cynthia Ng. On this episode, I have a very special guest. Her name is Catherine Yan. She is the Managing Director of IBM Malaysia. Now, Catherine has nearly 25 years of experience in the IT industry. Throughout her career, she has held management roles in many different countries. Uh, for instance, South Korea, uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Indonesia, and in 2019, she decided to come back to Malaysia to lead and drive the business of IBM here. So I want to thank uh, Catherine for making time for this interview and also welcoming me to your office here at IBM. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cynthia. Well, Catherine, um, I think you had what could be described as a uh, very successful career or a stint overseas, but can you tell us a bit about then your decision to return to Malaysia back in uh, 2019? What led to that? I've been away from Malaysia for almost um, one and a half decades, um, covering the regional roles, and um, it has actually brought me to more than 20 over countries, having experiences across uh, South Asia. But what um, has been missing in me is the sense of belonging at home, and wanting to make sure that uh, of all the contributions and also the experiences that has uh, brought me through the whole two and a half decades, I wanted to come back, uh, make an impact uh, in the country, drive diversity agenda, and most of all, is to be relevant. Mm -hmm. And I am so glad that after four years, I have seen uh, the fruits of uh, what I've been in um, over uh, since 2019. And uh, hopefully that uh, as we progress through and a lot of uh, the um, talents out there that's thinking of uh, coming back to Malaysia, it is really a good call back uh, as we can continue we can contribute back. Was that a difficult decision for you? Uh, I imagine that you have had a, a very good career overseas and just making that step back to Malaysia with a very different work environment and also job opportunities, was that something that you had to think about extensively before moving home? Well, indeed, uh, it was. Uh, there were a couple of um, criteria that came in. Um, it's all about relocation, uh, the opportunities uh, in Malaysia, um, what would be the settlement in after being out there for so mm -hmm. long. Uh, but um, the government ag agencies has really helped a lot. Right. I think uh, the Talent Corp uh, in Malaysia has facilitated uh, very much in my returning with the Return Expert Program uh, that I've embarked into. And it has uh, really get getting on what I call it as a seamless progression uh, to come back, um, the incentives uh, that was given and also the ease of uh, making sure that uh, I accustom back uh, to the country. But most of all, um, it is all about making sure that I adjust back to the country, the yeah. economies and making sure uh, the relevancy of uh, the digital transformation is where I could impact in the work that I do today. If you look at overall the setup of Talent Corp and its objectives, it has been very difficult for them to lure Malaysians back home. Uh, despite all the initiatives that has been rolled out, like tax exemptions and also family benefits, why has it been difficult, um, an uphill battle for us to lure highly skilled Malaysians back home? Well, there are a couple of contexts that attributes to it, um, the uh, social economy context, the political stability, mm -hmm. and I think most of all is the opportunities in country. Yep. Um, I would um, I would actually call it uh, the um, the need uh, to be able to have much more visibility towards what's uh, happening here in Malaysia um, as a major call out. Uh, number two is that uh, when we talk about uh, the effectiveness of infrastructure for the return expert programs, I think there's a lot of um, um, contention uh, to be able to promote uh, more frequently and uh, more massively um, across um, the talents out there. And uh, for me, I, I do my part as well as a returnee um, to be able to encourage uh, and to share the best practices um, across as to what are the uh, benefits that we could have seen coming back in Malaysia. The context of um, Malaysia um, as a economy of growth is so eminent mm. and uh, the returnees um, is going to be able to see that there are so much of opportunities in here that we could contribute back to the economy. Talk about Malaysia being an eminent place, you know, for a growing as a growing nation. Do you see there's more interest among talent, among companies, to come to Malaysia? Digital talents to me continues to be a journey uh, to success. Um, if you do a um, a ratio of um, observations across, um, it has been a agenda 
for every organization uh, to be picked on to ensure that we have the right digital talent mm -hmm. to grow the organizations and the business to the next level. Now, um, in, my, in my approach and in my observations, um, digital talents here in Malaysia still needs a lot more work to do. Um, for example, uh, the need uh, to co-create uh, ecosystems between public and private sectors to drive the digital talents of the future is a must. The need uh, to also observe how we can be able to drive back uh, the digital talents returnees uh, mm -hmm. who is now working abroad um, should be considered seriously. And number three is that on the digital talents is how much of pipelines uh, do we have to ensure that um, in three to five years' times the digital talents are not easily um, are unattainable, but uh, it is available in the marketplace. Um, you touch a bit about industries and companies are facing similar challenges in the war for talent. So, uh, despite the mass layoffs by global tech companies, the competition for talent is fierce as ever. Um, help us understand what's happening then in your industry. So digital talents um, across uh, the need in Malaysia has been growing um, to a consistent movement where, where we are actually seeing a lot of um, needs as compared to before. What do I mean by that? Uh, as you have seen the necessity in every organisation to drive talent and also transformation, um, it is um, talking about um, how much of skills mm -hmm. do I have in an organisation versus how much of technology do I invest. So... When we look at what organizations should be looking for, uh, it is all about making sure that um, when the structure of technology journey moves in in any organization planning, there must be substantial planning towards where are the talents within the organizations, how do they be able to acquire the talents, and how much investments can the organizations do to their existing people in the organization to skills them to the next level. Now, interestingly, when we talk about talent across organization, um, it is a crawl walk run strategy. And when we looked at how ready is a technology transformation in an organization, um, a proper planning needs to be uh, worked out to ensure that there is enough people skills mm -hmm. to be able to support the technology landscape that they're looking for. So in the context of Malaysia, do you see there's a talent gap at the moment? Well, um, the observations that I'm seeing and also um, having discussions uh, with um, various customers and also industries across, yes, mm -hmm. there is a talent gap. And um, what do we mean by that? Um, when we actually look at the construct uh, of um, the talents and the needs to be skilled, um, there is a need um, at all and the talent gaps that we are seeing is quite eminent. Now, when we look at uh, technology, the interesting part is that technology is working through at a very robust stage. Uh, it's so rapid and it's eminent that um, every day uh, the skill sets needs to be skilled. For example, um, at IBM Malaysia, um, what we have practiced is that uh, we invest through 60 hours of te technology skills to make sure that all our team is uh, staying on relevant mm -hmm. uh, to the technology skill sets of today to be able to stay abreast with the transformation journey and to be able to understand how do we impact through the technology changes that we have embraced within the organisation. A lot of major companies are cutting staff, uh, staff layoffs. I think IBM also has announced 3,900 globally. Um, how has that impact you, know, you as a managing director here in Malaysia in terms of uh, hiring and retention and what are the areas that you're looking to grow at? Right. Well, um, it has continuously a journey where every organisation would need to stay relevant and would need to continue to observe how we can be able to run the cost optimization to a greater mm -hmm. expect uh, to ensure that uh, the revenue growth, the profitability is always at the uptrend. And when we looked at um, the economies today, um, there are certain um, areas that needs to be resized mm -hmm. and there are certain areas that needs to be invested. And uh, where I would actually foresee the investment that will continue is the skills, the technology skills of um, the uh, talents within the organisation, um, the need to be able to invest where the rapid growth of the customer's experience comes in and also where the revenue growth trajectory can be achieved. And when I look at the talent across uh, Malaysia, it's, uh, it's going to be a very mixed um, 
um, practice uh, across uh, the year and throughout where the industries are, you will notice that the resizing of organisation is eminent, but the investment of few organisations is also rapidly growing. Mm -hmm. It really depends on um, how much uh, a balance of revenue growth versus profitability that an organisation can be able to foresee in the near future. In a tight labour market, is it harder for you to find the right talent? Well, it is. It is. Well, uh, when we actually look at, uh, when we actually look at uh, talents, um, the technical skills uh, talents um, are always uh, the most competitive mm -hmm. uh, skilled um, quadrant that uh, we look at. And um, it is also because we not only face um, competitions within the organisations in Malaysia, it's also um, the talents being poached. Uh, in the other developed countries Going as well. Going back to our brain drain exactly. uh, topic earlier. Exactly. And this is where um, uh, organisations like IBM Malaysia, we continue to strive to make the organisation a better place. Mm -hmm. We ensure that uh, the um, employees um, are skilled and uh, the value that they actually bring forth not only stays with them within the workplace that they are in, but it's also a live learning skills that they can bring forth. Now, besides... Uh upskilling and providing them with skills that they need. Employees, increasingly, they want more and more control of how they work, where they work, and when they work. So I do wonder at IBM, you know, how do you create career paths for your employees that allow for that kind of mobility and flexibility as a tool for retention? A, a sustenance of an organization as a great place to work comes with being relevant of how the employees feel. Mm. And uh, it's always um, a balance between um, productivity and also making sure that um, the interests of the employees are always held at the highest level. So what do I mean by that? Um, we have um, created um, and we have implemented a work-life integration mm -hmm. uh, here in this organisation. Uh, we believe uh, in running through a hybrid uh, model of uh, working environment as we are a meritocracy organisation, productivity okay. has always been um, make, uh, making sure that while the employees are able uh, to produce the best of the results uh, in the marketplace, they are also taken care from in terms of the context um, of their well-being. And uh, the well-being uh, of the employees are very personal. Um, as such, um, some employees would prefer a um, hybrid model of working uh, from home uh, in the organisations and in work that they are in. Um, some employees uh, prefer to have uh, mental health um, trainings, mental health uh, profile sharings. Some would love to have networking sessions. Have you seen results from those kind of measures that you have implemented? Oh, yes. Um, so, um, for the past uh, one year, we have actually seen um, so much of employees that came back and have told us that uh, they wanted an environment uh, where it's a safe place to work, mm -hmm. an environment where they feel comfortable being able to produce um, the best of what they do at work in the marketplace, but also being able to take care of their family back at mm -hmm. work. And this is where we have launched through uh, the work-life integration um, um, uh, structure. And from the engagement um, uh, point of view as well is always listening and what I've always seen is that um, it is a journey because we can be able to um, coexist together to see what the employees are looking for but at the same time um, making sure that um, they are at their level best in producing their output of productivity. Okay. Now, uh, I do want to um, hone in a little to talk about women, um, especially keeping women in the workforce. It's something that's a lot of debate going around. You know, yes, you know, Malaysia have improved you know, our maternity leave days from increasing it from 60 to 98. Uh, yet at the same time, it's worrying to hear that some employers now are choosing to uh, hire more men because of this reason. So. The term motherhood penalty is, is something that I do want to talk to you about. How do you feel about it? And what are policies do you think should be in place to level the playing field for women to stay and also for those who have left to come back to the workforce? Right. Well, diversity uh, and inclusion agenda is so real. 
Uh, and uh, in IBM Malaysia, what we practice uh, is that uh, we believe that diversity uh, is a very important flagship uh, to drive uh, uh, business essentials and productivity. Now, uh, my observation is that the government in Malaysia has started through a lot of um, initiatives mm -hmm. um, that encourages women to return to work, that encourages a certain percentage of representation of um, leadership yep. um, in the every board um, and organisations, and it is a good sign. And um, to me, the DNA has to be implemented within the organisation itself. Now, um, we have to walk the talk. And in, the, in where I, ob I observe today, um, it's interesting to see how many women are at the top position has a sustenance of more than two and a half decades. Uh, because it's not easy to be able to have them uh, sustain at a certain period. Um, there is um, a family um, they need to look after. Yeah. There is um, a lot of um, um, other factors that they could have just left the workplace. Now, what is important is that as we need to understand the women's um, needs versus um, uh, where we could have um, landed in, I think we need to actually create an environment to mandate through a certain um, uh, run throughs What do I mean by that? In the IBM Malaysia, uh, we practice through um, making sure that if a performance-based employee candidate is at par, um, it's always a women candidate that we pull in. Today, we pride ourselves to say that um, we have got a 55% women representation in this organisation. And our challenge today is not about representation only, is to move the women to the next level, is to make sure that they can co-create their current environment as a woman, making sure that their family um, is taken care of, um, a family as what I mean is that they could be a mom, a sister, a daughter, um, and, uh, and um, other responsibilities that they have, and making sure that um, we can be able to understand their needs through. Now, diversity is a agenda that I hold very dearly because women in technology is still a challenge in Malaysia. And uh, it's because of um, the um, ever um, changing technology that strives so hard in terms of um, making sure that um, the women work um, at a very long hours. Not many women appreciate yeah. and can be able to stay in the environment. So where we have uh, worked through is that um, we quadrant through the needs of the women's um, uh, priorities um, outside of work and we try to actually quadrant through what are the jobs um, um, uh, achievements that they would like to uh, to plan in within three to five years, and then we craft in. I think this is the best. That so that's a very deliberate policy of looking into each and every employee and the needs of of the uh, women. Is right. That how the approach is at IBM. Um, we strive to continue to see that there is a quadrant of uh, job scope um, that uh, we put through as whether it will suit um, what a woman or right. a woman can be able to take okay. on. But what is more important is that across the organisations uh, in the marketplace, um, as everybody dearly holds diversity as an agenda, um, the ever uh, matters is what can we practice um, to be able to cater for the women mm -hmm. um, um, uh, agenda here in the country? Is it a work-life integration you are talking about? Is it a safer environment for them to work? Uh, is it understanding that they can work from home or making sure that uh, if they don't travel overseas because they have a work um, a commitment with their family at home, it's okay? So these are the factors that uh, we need to weigh in uh, when we want to support um, a women's um, agenda in a career progression. Well, that's great what you're saying. How do we ensure that we create a more supportive environment for women uh, to stay in the workforce? And also, I think this, this idea about being penalised for you know, wanting to do it all. It was very interesting that um, in my last um, uh, event that I held on, the, on, the, um, on a public forum, um, and it was a question asked, if, if, I, will have to, uh, if I were to have a policy changed, um, what would be my policy change with the government? I'll say yeah. it will be salary equity. As I looked at uh, equality, um, it is real. And uh, this is where I continue to advocate, not only in my organisation, but uh, across a women in tech agenda as well, that uh, salary equality 
um, has to be seriously looked at. Um, aside from just compensating and recognising uh, the women out there, I think there is a need also to ensure that uh, when um, we hire the women um, uh, pool of talents into the organisation, the salary base has to be as competitive as the men's uh, salary base. Okay, well, that's uh, great to hear. That's what you're doing at IBM. Okay, I do want to uh, move the discussion to talk a bit about leadership. You mentioned early on in our discussion that there is still, there are women leaders like yourself, you know, in tech industry especially, but compared to men, it's still at a, a very low a ratio. Or why do you think that is the case? Throughout my two and a half decades um, of uh, my career journey, um, I would um, say that the gender um, biasness um, experiences has been real, right? Um, throughout uh, where I observe, especially in the technology industry, um, the um, gap between uh, the diverse uh, uh, gender, male, female, is slightly um, a bigger gap compared to many organisations. Mm -hmm. Technology industry is a very, um, it's a very robust uh, industry and it is uh, um, it's also because it's so high in expectations uh, and it's, um, it's an experience that um, a woman has to continue to push forward. Now, working through 90 hours a week for me is by choice. Um, and it is because of the technology changes um, every day I have to run through to reskill myself in terms of um, how I need to be relevant in my technology workplace. Um, I have to fight with the big boys club, right, uh, to make sure that uh, I'm at the same level playing field yeah. um, out there. And uh, it is a journey. Now, why um, there is um, always um, a, a resistance for a few women uh, to be able to uh, climb up uh, the ladder is because it's the time that is needed um, um, away uh, from their family a time that's needed away uh, uh, from where they, they do in their personal lives um, to be able to commit um, to the corporate ladder. Um, that's always um, a milestone changes as to whether you want to actually put that commitment. And the second part is that um, there are very few women uh, up um, in the organisation and sometimes um, it's uh, the discomfort of, um, I call it, uh, being lonely with the big boys club. Uh, it is real. Right, and, um, and as you navigate through, um, and I always advocate, you have to be, you don't have to be them, but you have to exist with them. How did you overcome that? Well, um, I would actually say that uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a journey through that um, I, 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 I didn't, I, it, it was not natural for me, right? I learned uh, from the, um, um, the mistakes that, uh, that I've seen, I've mm -hmm. done, and I'll, I'm, I also embrace through the changes. But uh, one, thing that, uh, one thing that really stuck out is that if, um, if there's one word that I could describe is resilience. You need to be resilient in where you are and um, you need to be confident. Um, I remembered um, two decades ago, I would step in, into a meeting room um, full of uh, men and I dare not even speak up because I thought my voice didn't matter. I thought that uh, my voice would have been drowned. Um, but I've learned along the way that it was just my perception. Okay. Uh, it was not of other people's perception. It was that whole um, inferior complexity in me that men are always uh, probably more, far more superior. But two decades later, uh, I advocate through a lot uh, with uh, my mentees, with my uh, women leaders as well, uh, that the glass ceiling is for us to break. The glass ceiling is not, is not meant for them to step over. So as I progress through, I think it's the learnings and it's the journeys that uh, I've experienced through that I learn to be uh, tougher, uh, I learn to be relevant, mm -hmm. and most of, all, most of all is that I learn to appreciate my voice. Right, that's wonderful, um, Catherine. I think you know, there's been a lot of discussion about putting more women uh, in leadership positions. You know, what does having women in leadership positions, how does it make a difference and what value does it bring to a company in your personal experience? Right. Um, there has been a lot of observations uh, that we have seen that uh, women um, in a diverse or rather a diverse organisation with women leaders um, does make an impact to business outcomes. Um, it actually also ensures that every organisation are 
having a very well represented voice in terms of commands. Women tend to be meticulous, um, uh, articulative, and also um, um, I call it as opinionated. Right, uh, and uh, as you blend in uh, where the organisation stands in, um, you would actually see that a lot of other organisations blends in will have a very blended and all-rounded business outcomes. And we have seen it in IBM where the diverse agenda that hits in above 30% of ratio mm -hmm. has a better business outcome performance as compared to the lesser percentage of ratio.